Hi, it's Cory Doctorow. I'm back at the UCLA Law School for the Copyright Office's Triennial 1201 Exemptions hearing about the Digital Learning Copyright Act with Jay Freeman. Uh, Jay runs Sadia. Uh, Sadia does uh, some stuff that helps people get more out of their iPhones. And uh, Jay, I know you were on a panel at the earlier round of these in DC about jailbreaking. So maybe you could talk about what Sadia does and what you t talked about on your panel. Oh. So Cydia is an alternative to the App Store for jailbroken iPhones. And I tend to describe it like that because Cydia is not about apps. Uh, Cydia is a, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a system that allows you to install modifications to the operating system. It allows you to install modifications to other running applications. Uh, and it does all of this in a way um, that uh, doesn't actually require making a permanent modification to that software. It instead is all done in memory on your system while it is running. Uh, this, this is, this is um, very different in some ways when people will talk about, a, for example, having uh, things are rejected from the App Store. Uh, instead, we're about uh, extensions, kind of like you might see with like a browser extension. So, mm -hmm. what, and what did you talk about on your panel? Yeah, so during that panel, we were talking about extending the existing exemption on jailbreaking, um, which is uh, defined in a particular way of being able to uh, make modifications to the functionality and software and particularly to be able to disable um, uh, functionality on a device um, and then uh, which ex previously had existed for um, mobile all-purpose computing devices uh, and what we were hoping to expand that to include uh, voice assistant tools, um, including things like uh, Google Home, uh, Apple uh, HomePod, and the Amazon Alexa. And, um, you know, as you described some of the mods to me the other day that Cydia enables, um, you know, press two buttons to turn on the flashlight and yeah. all kinds of great stuff, it struck me that what you were enabling was what we might have called a few years ago a kind of long tail, that, that the one side doesn't fit all. Um, can you talk about some of the, the interesting ways that um, you've come up with uh, for making iPhones work better for specific people? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so um, that long tail is very important because uh, when you think about um, what uh, Apple's looking for something, features that will make everyone happy and they have to come up with features that everyone will be able to understand. And so um, what we're enabling is the ability for an individual developer to essentially scratch their own itch in a way that just confuses everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, a really funny example of this is that um, so yes, uh, the you know the iPhone keyboard is a great keyboard. I mean, I, I love using the iPhone keyboard. Some people really like hardware keyboards because the hardware keyboard is something that you can use while you're um, like you know sitting in your pocket, or you can like maybe while you're not looking at the device, it'll be easier to calibrate on it. But what if I told you that there are people who can type in Morse code faster than you could ever type QWERTY wow. on a tiny little keyboard, right? And so we had um, we had the ability to just have. A, uh, integration of Morse code keyboards well before Apple had anything that was uh, allowed you to custom, they didn't have custom keyboards until iOS 8, right? And so that, that, that was like eight years of time whereby um, if you wanted to have a modification like that, you needed to have a jailbroken device. Um, we have extensions for people who are blind um, that allow them to more easily use the uh, voice assistant tools. Um, in some cases, it's to extend that voice assistant functionality into applications that previously did not support it. Um, we have modifications that um, enable specific workflows that people have related to um, the email application mm -hmm. um, and because it, it, the, um, the Apple's email application is set up in, with a specific power saving functionality um, that uh, because it's essentially it's tied into the way that you push notifications actually I guess maybe a little more complicated to try to bring up but huh. yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I know that um, Apple's argument is that uh, they just can't make a good phone if you're allowed to override their choices. That you know, once you once you uh, if you if you let people tick a box that says let me make my make up my own mind, that all the elegant design would just run out of that checkbox. Like a like yeah. you know you pull the plug on the phone. Um, can you talk about the right to repair legislation and the right to repair movement and how you see? people like you who, who want to get more out of your iPhone and help other people get more out of their iPhones interacting or living side by side with people who are happy with the choices Apple made. Absolutely. I mean, so the first thing I, I always just find um, that, that that argument comes up very often and it oftentimes does, does come up from Apple. Uh, and I always find it a really strange argument uh, considering the, the device was, I would describe, de facto open uh, for many years after it launched. Mm -hmm. uh, we had found uh, boot ROM exploits, exploits in the um, core 
software that is running on the phone that is very difficult, if not impossible in some cases, for Apple to update. And because of that, um, for the first around four to five years of the iPhone's existence, um, we typically had complete access to the device. Anyone who wanted to could install relatively easy software and make any modifications. And yet the iPhone became a popular platform that everyone wants. Hmm. And so um, the, the idea that they need control that they never had in order to build a popular platform that they did succeed in building almost seems absurd to me. Um, but now to continue your, I mean, answer your question, you talked about right to repair, and I think that that is uh, just a very important thing. Um, these devices uh, are built out of, uh, out of, out of very expensive um, underlying raw materials. A lot of these raw materials are, are, are essentially now being like you know strip mined in, in, in other countries, and these are things that um, it just it, it just it, there's so many interesting complicated issues with relation to um, recycling, with relation to um, just you know destroying these raw materials, with relation to just the trade interfaces with other countries, um, and um, the idea that people are essentially going to like they, they buy one of these devices, and then after four or five years, Apple stops making software updates to them. Mm -hmm. And now you're unable to essentially maintain that tool that you have. You're, um, a as, as people start to find um, issues with it, you're unable to fix those issues. If you accidentally break the home button, you're unable to repair it. And so instead, you just throw it away. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, Apple has a repair program. Um, and that, I'm sorry, Apple has a recycling program. But that recycling program only recycles some of the components of the device. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the vast majority of the device is still just something that is like this precious artifact that just ends up getting destroyed. Uh, and so the right to repair legislation is something that is, um, I, I think, is just very important, um, both for like the you know, future of humanity in a way, but also in, in, from this perspective that when you own something, it's not something that is that can be taken away from you either by accident or that can be taken away from you by um, other parties deciding to stop support. And so you, your your view, you've talked about providing uh, access codes or, or other systems that would allow people like you to yeah. to keep those cars on the road to keep those phones in people's pockets. Yeah. Um, what did you have in mind? Well, so for me, a, a, a very important aspect of this is that you need to be able to change all the software that's on your phone. If, if, there's, if, there's a, um, if there are mistakes or flaws that are found in the security of your phone, you need to be able to, to, be able to fix those. And in cases where Apple's releasing software updates, that great, that's great, but Apple stops releasing software updates after some period of time. And yet this piece of hardware, which you spent hundreds, if not a thousand dollars on, is something that was just suddenly you're almost like afraid to use. And so um, if the owner of the device, not any random person, but if the owner of the device was able to, once the, the pin code unlocked the device, install an arbitrary replacement operating system on it, that would give us hmm. a large amount of flexibility in order sure. to be able to maintain that device over time, whether it, whether it be um, that you could just install tiny, tiny modifications to the, uh, that are running in memory for that software, not, not distributing a new copy at all, but just modifying in RAM the, run, the running version, um, or um, which requires essentially being able to um, bypass some of the uh, modification checks, or whether it is to replace wholesale that operating system um, with a more open, uh, op more open replacement. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Jay. I really appreciate this. Uh, it's great to, to finally put a face to the yeah. name. Th same here. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.